recent years, Hyundai has done a remarkable job reinventing itself as a brand. And not only have we got a really impressive range of passenger vehicles and SUVs, it also broke into the luxury market with its Genesis brand. But now, the South Korean car maker is going for an entirely different type of audience, the performance audience. And the car it's going to do that with is this, the i30N. But Hyundai hasn't come to a knife fight armed with a toothpick. The i30N has a turbo 2 litre that pumps 202 kilowatts and 353 newton meters to the front wheels via a limited slip dip. Zero to 100? That'll come up in a claimed 6.2 seconds. So it's quick then. So we brought the i30N here to the Haunted Hills Raceway to introduce it to not just a handful of its rivals, but 11 contenders in the high performance affordable segment. With its labyrinth of nearly 20 corners crammed into just 1,300 metres, the Bryant Park hill climb is no place for autobahn storming GTs, but the perfect blacktop to test light and nimble performance cars. GT race ace Renato Liberto will be our hired gun. He might be more at home at the wheel of a Ferrari factory race car, but the seasoned circuit driving coach's job is to push each of the 12 contenders to the limit and find which is the best all-rounder on track. So let's get started. At almost 52 grand, the Mini is the most expensive car we have on test here today. And like a majority of the contenders, it goes to battle with a two litre turbo four pot and front wheel drive. It wasn't that fast in, in a lap time to be honest. I mean, the gearbox in it was pretty slow. It was, okay. it was holding gears when, it, when I, I really needed it to drop a gear. Something with that JCW badge needs to be a little more aggressive and, and hardcore, I think. But it's uh, still a great fun car. With a badge like the John Cooper Works name on the Mini, you should imagine it would be pretty spectacular at a circuit like this. But unfortunately, it didn't do quite as well as I was expecting. Okay, I'll let you in on a secret. It was the slowest today. But the Mini is another great example of how tens of a second and lap times don't necessarily equate to fun. The Mini is huge fun for a number of reasons. One, it's got that lovely sharp chassis, really communicative steering, it sounds great, and other stuff intangibles like it looks good and weirdly this one even smells really nice. The Mini is a great example of how a hot hatch can still be fun even if it doesn't necessarily win the day in the Haunted Hills. They might be owned by the same parent company but the BMW and the Mini couldn't be more different. The 125i is the only rear wheel drive here and it's the only 8-speed auto. That combination should suit this tight technical track. Huge amount of fun as you'd expect. The BMW chassis has always been very, very direct and you, you feel a lot of what the car's doing. Didn't translate so well in lap time. It's still a very lively car and while I thought the drive, being rear wheel drive over these crests would really help the thing, the problem is because the engine's so rev happy over those crests it would light up quite a bit. The BMW is not the fastest here, but what it categorically proves is that fun is so important in this hot hatch segment. It is still a hatchback after all, but when you combine that smooth 2-litre turbo front engine at the front with rear-wheel drive at the back, it is massively enjoyable and obviously <laughs> way easier to get the tail out than in any of the other cars we're driving here. The BMW really is standalone in the way it delivers the performance and dynamics on a track like this. Which is why I'm going around again. <laughs> The Subaru WRX has an unorthodox flat four engine and performance comparable with the other 11 cars. But as a larger sedan, it's a model you might not expect to be included with this comparison. Certainly still front diff, you know, it's, it's got power and torque there, but pulling out of some of these tight corners where you, when the thing comes on boost, it really lacks that kind of front grip that you'd think you would get out of an all-wheel drive car. The chassis doesn't let you float the rear into the corner right. so much compared to, say, something like the Type R and things like that. So that's where it really kind of lost time compared to, you know, those quicker cars. The reason it's here, though, is because of that WRX name. It's got pure performance heritage and, and provenance. However, up against some of those bantam weights with equally sized engines and a little bit more power, it can't quite, quite keep up in lap times. It is still a huge amount of fun. What if we gave the WRX a 500cc bigger engine, a heap more power and a variable centre differential? What then? This is the WRX's more athletic sibling, the STI. 
the, the, the best thing on a track like this for a car like this is to be able to control that centre diff. To, to be able to push some more drive away from the front wheels when you need to out of these corners really helped. Um, it didn't translate too much in lap time and I think the tyre didn't really sh let it shine in terms of its suspension and mechanical grip um, around this sort of course. Again, if you had a faster flowing place like Phillip yeah. Island, you would see a massive difference in lap time between the standard WRX and the STI. Oh, so much grip, it's incredible in corners like that. You can just get the power on early and it just shucks you out of those corners with unbelievable potency. It does unfortunately suffer a little bit from the extra weight but it more than makes up for it in grip and outright grunt. Some would say perhaps a two and a half litre is an unfair comparison, but it fits the price bracket. But we're not done with the sedan contenders just yet. The Octavia RS245 goes to battle with 180 kilowatts and a snappy seven speed dual clutch automatic. But measuring an almost 4.7 meters long, it's the biggest machine on the track. It was actually quite quite good around corners. The thing that really let it down then in terms of the lap time from my point of view was even with traction control, stability control, everything switched off. The ESP, like a rollover protection or something, would kick in so I'd lose throttle. It wouldn't give me the gear when I would want to either. Right. So okay. there was a few things in each lap that really cost it in terms of lap time. But I'd tell you what, down the, the back straight we've got here, up and out of the hill, it was as quick nearly as the Type R. So really, really fast in the straights. Great braking, really, really good chassis, but those couple of little electronic things yeah. just meant I didn't really extract a good lap time out of it. It's longer wheelbase and slightly heavier mass makes it a little bit more cumbersome around these tight corners, but on a straight like this where you can really get that power down, it's properly quick. Put it on a circuit with some longer straights and some slightly wider turns, and I suspect the Skoda would have done a lot better in the present company. If you had to pick a contender here that screamed hot hatch without turning a single wheel, it would have to be the Focus ST. It has plenty of power from its 2.0-litre turbo 4, but its conspicuous body kit and deep Recaro seats speak volumes. Great sound, um, that engine, you know, nice torque and power plant. What really let it down in lap time is the differential in the front end. Just for these right. tighter corners and over these crests, it really struggled to get power down. Super communicative chassis, I've driven the older generations of these and you still get that classic front wheel drive where you can float the rear end in the corners. Yep. And because you've always got that power available at the front end, you can you know, let it float and then really drive it hard and sort of tow the rear end back in as you progress between some of the quicker corners here. The ST has kind of been a little bit forgotten recently because, of course, its bigger sibling, or at least its more powerful sibling, the RS, came along, which is an undoubtedly amazing car. But the ST still remains an absolute scorcher in its own right. On a track like this, it really shows up just how capable it is. I thought it was going to fall by the wayside and really feel a little bit heavy and old, but actually up against some really strong competitors, this is fantastically good. It's actually a huge amount of fun. One of the most underrated cars we've seen here today. But if the Ford is a little too brash, and if everything we've driven so far is just a little too big, and if you're craving something a little more, well, French, then how about our lightest contender? With 162 kilowatts, the Clio RS is also the least powerful, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the slowest. Given the size, very, very agile. The change of direction through some of these sort of tighter sections is great. Obviously, the paddle shift gearbox, you know, most of the cars we've had so far are manual. So having paddle shift means in a very sort of short, sharp section of corners here, you're less busy with gear changes going on. Yeah. That makes a big difference. But it didn't actually translate into that quicker lap time. In, in race mode, which is what I had it set in then, in RS mode with race, um, it never denied me a gear shift and it let me short shift and, you know, and sit on the limiter a lot as well. So that it actually, you might hear it from the in-car, there's a lot of beeping going on inside the car. I thought it was a traction control thing. I think it's just an audible rev limit, basically, that it has. It's not so. just us bleeping at your swearing. Yeah, it could be a little <laughs> bit of that. It could be a bit of that. On the downside, it just can't keep up with some of the power of the bigger engines here. But... What is really great about this little car is it's got such a dynamic chassis. It just dances around. And with all that lack of noise insulation and bulk, it sounds a bit like a road legal racer from in the cabin as well. It's, it's just so involving and so much fun. My one main criticism though, you know what I'm gonna say, no manual gearbox. This is an excellent auto, definitely, but 
for the true immersive road legal race car experience. I'd love to be selecting those gears with a, a manual selector down there. No affordable performance car fight would be complete without the iconic Golf GTI. And with three doors, this limited edition original is a little more special as it honours the original Mark I. Uh, probably the only downside for a car like this being front wheel drive is over these sort of rises into corners, you get a bit of that power understeer where you're sort of losing traction at the front end. But because the chassis is so communicative, you can really actually float the rear of the car and actually exploit that aspect of the car to help give you sort of momentum over those turns. So a, a heap of fun. I'm pleased to say there is that familiarity that you always get in a GTI, that chuckability, it just feels so light on its toes, so capable. There might be some slightly stronger performers here in terms of outright performance, but it's going to be very long and Volkswagen's going to have to do something really wrong before we stop comparing everything else in its class to the venerable Golf GTI. But like the pair of Subarus we have here, the Golf also has a more serious, more powerful cousin that likes to go to the gym a lot and is ready to step in and defend its milder relative with a second driven axle and 213 kilowatts. And this one is also the grid edition, which means it gets even more goodies. It was about a second faster on the, on the time, so serious. it's still it's translated difference. into a quicker lap time. Wow. There's so many tight radius corners here over Crest where a front wheel drive, and you can even feel this car hopping a little bit for traction at the front, but yep. you feel the rear pushing it out as you drove out of the corner. So, so it brings in the tail end when it needs it, it's mostly front wheel drive. Exactly yeah. right, yeah. What I particularly like about this car is that it drives for a majority of the time like the front wheel drive GTI, but then when you chuck it into a corner with too much of a heavy hand, like that, it brings in those rear wheels for a little bit more reassuring traction and stability. And on a particularly tricky track like this, that's a welcome thing. Often overlooked in the segment, the Peugeot 308 GTI is the real quiet achiever here today. It packs an even 200 kilowatts, but weighing in at just 1,205 kilos, it has the best power to weight ratio of them all. Carries 166 kilowatts per tonne sound. It's super quick between corners. The gear ratio is really suited this layout. Yeah. It has its own feel to it, its yeah. own character. It's got a great engine note as well. I hadn't really heard this engine before just driving it then. And it's even with the helmet on, you can really hear the engine growling from behind. And when you hit that sport button, obviously it makes it all that yeah. louder as well. It's got those quintessentially French things like a steering wheel you look over the top of and not through, and a tachometer that goes the wrong way. However, this car really surprises and delights in other ways. Most notably, it's the third fastest here today. But also, it's got a chassis that responds not really like anything else here today. A really pointy front end, really responsive and very forgiving nature, which is good with someone like me at the wheel. I've been really surprised by this car and for it to fit into the top three and look as handsome as it does, that is a huge achievement. But if there was one car here that was going to rain on the Hyundai's party, then it would be this, the Honda Civic Type R. It's already demolished records at the Nürburgring, and its giant slaying circuit honeability is going to be a hard act to beat. It was fast, yeah. yeah. I think uh, it probably could have gone over a second quicker if second gear was a little bit longer. Okay. I was having to go into third to stop you know, running out of puff on some of the shorter straights here. Yeah. And if I could have saved that gear change up and back by having a slightly longer second gear, I reckon we would have gone probably a second quicker. This car, you can tell from the absolute word go that it was designed for the track like this. It is so sharp and so switched on and super flat through corners. And of course, there's all that power as well. There is no denying that this car is unbelievably focused and one of the fastest front wheel drives we've ever driven at wheels. Remarkable, but is that enough when faced with the newcomer from South Korea? That was quick, got into the one threes on, that, uh, on the first lap. Are you serious? Yep. On the uh, center dash, there's a, a custom setting in the end mode. Yep. And uh, everything was set to you know Sport Plus or, or, or off, except ESP still had a Sport setting on it, and suspension was still in Sport mode, not in Sport Plus mode. So that small change just made the car come alive that little bit more, especially over these crests and bumps. You're getting less of it cutting out throttle, and obviously getting you moving faster between those corners. So this is the one we are really focused on today, the i30N. 
car that does so much so well. It's got just the right amount of power. It's got a beautiful chassis. It's one of the best looking cars we've got here today, without a doubt. And it's got that exhaust note as well, which is just demonic madness. That's the thing with the i30N. In a word, balance. It does everything just right. Not too much power, not too fearsome on the track, not too uncomfortable on the road. And what do you know, the result of that is, it's the quickest car we've had here today. Renato was telling me before that if you put a set of tyres on this car, like the Civic wears, it would be a, probably a whole second quicker as well. For a single car to achieve so much on only its first attempt at the affordable high performance segment, a segment that has been dominated by some incredibly strong models for so long, that's truly remarkable.